Seated. Thank you for the wilderness where I learned to thirst for your presence.
Amen. And then I teach you a new song. It's very easy. And I will teach you the chorus part. Let's go like this. Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the rolling lion, all be still and behold Him. That's it. light walk across the pages of time he who made every living thing behold him he who heard humanity's cries that in drunk to wake as a child he became like the least of us behold him Jesus Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the rolling lion, oh, be still and behold Him. and saints, heal the blind, the lost, and the lame, even now he is in our midst, behold him, he who chose the criminal's hand, paid with blood to settle our death, buried at our heroes to life, behold him, Jesus Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the rolling lion, oh, be still and behold Him, Jesus, Alpha and Omega, our God, the risen Savior, oh, be still and behold Him. Holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy, worthy to receive all praise. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy, worthy to receive. against the chorus part. Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the rolling lion, oh, be still and behold Him. Jesus, Alpha and Omega, our God, the risen Savior,
all stand Amazing grace again. Amazing grace. You may be seated. So we've come to that time in the service this morning where we're going to partake in communion together. If you did not grab a cup on your way in, if you wouldn't mind just lifting your hand and someone will come by and, and bring one to you. So just a reminder that communion is a time for us to come together. It's a time where actually Jesus had, had um, commanded and had given instruction on how we were to remember his great sacrifice and what he did. And so communion is, is a special time. It's a time for us to come together as as a people, as the children of God, and to say, we will never forget. We'll never forget, Lord, what you did when you came to this earth, when you walked this earth, and when you gave your life on that cross. And so these are symbols, in some way, of Jesus' sacrifice. The bread, a symbol of his body, which he said with his disciples on that night was was his body that was broken. And it was broken for you and for me. And the blood is, is represented 
in the juice as we drink it. As the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And so we partake as a way to say, Lord, we will never forget. And to thank him for what he's done for us. And so Paul writes to the church in Corinth, he says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Shall we partake of the bread together? In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Shall we drink together? Our ushers are going to come by and collect the cups, so if you would, just pass those. Um, Actually, you don't need to pass them. They can just walk right up to you. We have empty rows between everybody. So, While they're doing that, let's go to the Lord and just ask that um, that he'd bless our time this morning and just thank him. Lord, we come to you today, and we just want to say thank you. We, We want to say thank you for for choosing to come to the world in the way that you did, for choosing to save us. And so we want to say thank you. We want to thank you for the cross. We want to thank you that you gave your life for us. And so we come this morning, Lord, thanking you for that. Also, Lord, we come asking that you would just bless our time as we prepare to open your word, as we prepare to read from it and and to hear you speak. And so we ask that you would just fill this place with your presence and that we would hear you speak this morning, Lord, and that you would touch each one of us in some special way and that we would leave today, Lord, having experienced the power of your presence and having seen your miracles among us and having heard you speak. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are continuing our series this morning, um, part two of The Road Marked in Blood. And we're in the book of Ephesians chapter 3, and so if you want to make your way there, uh, we'll be reading from there in just a few moments. I read once about a fellow that said, it was my first night caring for an elderly patient. And when he grew sleepy, he said, I I wheeled his chair close to the bed, as close as I possibly could. And he says, and then using the techniques that I had learned in school, I I grasped him in sort of this bear hug kind of a position, and I attempted to lift him up onto the bed. He said, and I summoned all of my strength and might, and I trying to hoist him onto the bed, but I couldn't get him high enough onto the mattress and and then had to sort of flop him back into the chair. And I thought, well, okay, we're going to give this a second try. And so he mustered up as much strength as he could, and he he bear hugs this gentleman again, and, and he gets him just over the edge of the mattress and flops him onto the bed. Well, when the night shift nurse arrived, he says, I was telling her about sort of this incident, and she says, looking really puzzled at me, she says, well, that's unusual because usually I just ask him to get up into bed, and he does. So, (laughs) that's funny. So, if they told me, or or actually, so so they once told me that, um, that I had type A blood, but actually it was a typo. 
Let me let that sink in for a second. And there's, there is a pessimist blood type. Did you know that? It's called B negative, right? What does the, why in the world does a nurse have a red pen? It's in case she has to draw blood. Yeah, how about that one? You know, my cousin, my cousin died last week. You see, he, he needed a blood transfusion, but we didn't know his blood type. And as he died, he just kept telling us, be positive. Be positive. But I have to tell you, it's really hard to be positive since he's been gone, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> some of you got that. Some of you didn't. You're just looking at me funny. I couldn't help myself with the blood jokes. You know? I mean, the, the title of our message this morning is The Road Marked in Blood. And uh, there is a way, the Bible says, uh, there is a way that seems right to a man, but it says in the end it leads to death. But there's also another way, as Jesus describes it, it's the way of the cross. And he says, if you would take up your cross and follow me. He also says that wide is the gate and broad is the path that leads to destruction. And many people are going to go down that road. But narrow is the gate and the path that leads to eternal life, and few people are going to find it. And so there are roads in life. But there is one road, a road marked in blood. And it's a road that leads us to the cross. It leads us, and last week we discovered it leads us to a place of hope, to a place of peace. And it leads us home. And so we pick up here in Ephesians chapter 3, and I want to read this with you as we're continuing our study through the book of Ephesians. And we're going to read this together as Paul is addressing the people there in Ephesus from prison. And you remember that he is in prison writing this letter. And so he starts in verse 1. By the way, verse 1 is the beginning of verse 14. What I mean by that is he, he says in verse 1 a little statement, and then he sort of goes off on a little bit of a different topic for the next several verses. And then in verse 14, he picks up where he left off there in verse 1. So you can read that on your own and discover that that's true. Some of your Bibles may have a hyphen after verse 1, right? That's because it's really connected to verse 14. But he says this in verse 1, he says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, which by the way is an interesting statement because Paul's a prisoner of Rome, right? And everyone knows this, he's in jail, but he says, look, I'm, I'm, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. In other words, my master is not the Roman government, but my master is Jesus. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, he says, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, that it's, it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery, he says in verse 6, is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. And we talked about this a little bit last week, how the Gentiles were sort of outside of the blessing of God. And by the way, a Gentile is everyone who is not a Jew, okay? And so if you're not a Jew, you are a Gentile. And according to Jewish laws and customs and the religion of the day, and even still today it's this way, you're an outsider. You can't go into the holiest of places. You can't commune with God. You're somehow less. And so he says in verse 7, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of His power. He says, although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ 
and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, and according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. And in him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, do not be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Have you ever had a humbling experience in your life? You're laughing. You're like, of course I have. <laughs> I was thinking about this. I've had a lot, by the way. And, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to talk about them, right? I was thinking about this. Even this morning, this thought came to me as I was sort of getting ready. And I thought, you know what? Because I, I, I have a lot. And I thought, well, th- I'll tell you guys about a couple of them. So, so one of my humbling experiences was, I, I, some of you know, I pastored a church here in town for a number of years. And um, it, luckily, uh, and I would lead a Wednesday Bible study. We did that every week for, for years and years, you know. So, so my, my, sort of my, my, pu- my public appearances, okay, were on Sunday mornings and Wednesday mornings and sometimes Wednesday nights or whatever, right? And I use that public appearances, but because... This it has to do with my humbling experience. Well, well, when I was in, when I was like, I don't know, 11 years old or so, I had the brilliant idea of riding my skateboard down the sidewalk um, on, my, on my knees. And so I, I was on my knees on my skateboard, and I was just going. I mean, I was moving fast, you know. I mean, we're, you know, going fast. Well, sidewalks have cracks in them, you know. And you don't think about these things when you're, 11, when you're an 11-year-old boy. And so... I'm going down the sidewalk, I mean, at super speed, right? I mean, I'm moving, and I hit this big crack, and the skateboard stops, and I don't. And I'm like, boom, the skateboard stops, and I just face plant on the sidewalk, bust my teeth, one of my front teeth just completely gone, and, uh, and, so, and, and it was a permanent tooth, it wasn't a baby tooth. Anyway, so I'm, I'm like, I'm there, I'm all crying and upset, and I'm like, oh, I've lost my tooth, and I'm trying to pick up the pieces, thinking that maybe I could put it back, like, I don't know. So I'm like, and so I, I go inside, and, and, and my mom's like, well, what happened, you know? And so anyways, I go to the, uh, the dentist, and they, they patch it up, and then years later, I get, a, I get a crown, like a cap on my front tooth. So this tooth right here is a fake tooth. It's not real. Well, fast forward a little bit. So I'm pastoring the church here, and, uh, and on, a, on a Friday, okay, this happened on a Friday, I wake up, and I'm brushing my teeth, and my tooth falls out, okay, and I'm like, what just happened, you know, my tooth fell out, like, and, I, and I'd never seen myself smile without a tooth, really, I mean, I, it'd been a long time, and so I, I'm looking in the mirror, and I'm smiling. I'm like, oh, my goodness, I can never go out. I can't go out in public like that. i got to preach in two days. <laughs> Anyways, so I call, and I, I had saved the two that's there. So I, I called up this dentist, and, I, and by the way, I'm a typical dude. I don't go to the doctor or the dentist. Like, that's just not what I do. And so I, I didn't really have a typical dentist, right, a regular dentist. But, but I found one that was open, and I get down there, and I'm like, I, you got to fix this for me. Like, I'm going, I'm preaching on Sunday morning. Like, this is bad. Anyways, he patched it up, and I only had, that, and that was the next day. He was like, I can see you on Saturday morning. So I went the whole day Friday, um, trying really hard not to smile. And, um, you know, um, it was convenient, though, with a straw. You could just put a straw right, right in there and just, <laughs> you know. And so, I mean, it was pretty good. But, but I didn't want to live that way forever. Anyways, so, so. I had another humbling experience once when I was in high school, and I might have shared this with you. I don't remember now, but but I grew up with three sisters, and uh, we you know we were always fighting for the bathroom and whatever. And I never got it. I, I mean, I never got the bathroom. So I was lucky if I got in there. I, I mean, it was like a miracle if I could get three minutes in the bathroom on a school day before school started. So so on this particular day. We get up, and it's like every other day, and, I, and I'm walking in, and, and I'm yelling at it. We're always yelling. We're like, get out of the bathroom. You know, we're always, oh, that was our morning routine. And, uh, and I realized that I, I didn't have any clean jeans or pants for the day, so I'm like, oh, man, I really hope somebody did some laundry, right? So I run into the, the laundry room, and we have like less than 10 minutes before we got to leave. 
I run into the laundry room, and I'm, I'm rifling through the, the dryer, and I, sure enough, oh, there's a pair of jeans. Perfect. This is perfect, you know? I just throw the jeans on, and I get out of the house, right? I'm out the house. I, I, I'm in, so I'm in my first period class now, and, uh, and I'm sitting in class in, in Algebra 2. Okay, uh, this is Algebra 2. I'm sitting, and we had a test that day. I remember this ex- explicitly. We had a test. That was a big test. And I'm sitting there, and the teacher passes out the test, and so everyone's quiet, and we're, we're getting ready to start, and I start, I, you know, I put my name on it, and I get started, and, uh, and I'm focusing on the test, and I reach down to my pant leg, and I'm like, man, I'm itching my pant leg, not thinking anything of it, and, I, and as I itch it, I'm like, something's in my pant leg, what is that? And so I reach into my pant leg, thinking, oh, it's the dryer sheet, you know, the dryer sheet will get stuck in there, so well, I reach into my pant leg, and I pull out a pair of my sister's underwear (laughs) in my pant leg. I mean, I'm a 16-year-old dude in algebra class, and I'm like, what is this? You know, and I I shove it back up in there, you know. I didn't know what to do with it, so I shoved it back up in my pant leg. And so, so anyways, I don't know how well I did on that test, by the way. I can't even remember that part. But but I'm thinking the entire time, how am I going to get rid of this out of my pant leg now? And hopefully while I'm walking somewhere, it doesn't fall out, right? I'm like, what is this? Anyway, so we had lockers at my high school. So after class, I darted over to my locker, and when nobody was looking, I like p- pulled my sister's underwear out and threw it in my locker and shut the door really fast. Well, her underwear stayed in my locker the entire year, okay? Because <laughs> I was... I don't know what to do with it. I mean, what do you do? Anyways, yeah. We, have you ever had a, a humbling experience like that? I mean, anyways. So, listen. Paul makes a pretty profound statement. He says it there in verse 8. He says this. He says, listen. Although I am less than the least, of all of God's people, His grace was given to me. You see, the point really, I think, as, as Paul says, by the way, Paul was a great writer. He was a brilliant man. He's not speaking about his intellectual ability. He's not speaking about his overall ability when he says, I am the least, or the, I am the least of the least. I mean, I am less than the least, he says. But what Paul's expressing here, I think, is is humility. And I really believe that humility is the vehicle by which you must travel the road. If you were to walk the road marked in blood, you must travel on the vehicle of humility. Spurgeon, the great preacher, once said, he said, about this particular verse. He says, But while Paul was thus thankful for his office, his success, and it greatly humbled him. And he said this. I thought this was a profound statement. He says, The fuller that a vessel becomes, the deeper it sinks in the water. And a plenitude of grace is a cure for pride. What does he mean by that? Well, he says, Listen, if you require a lot of grace in your life? That's the cure for pride. I want to tell you that that people people have a hard time with the concept of being humble. We all do. I, I do. It's difficult to humble yourself. We've all been humble. But it's an entirely different thing to humble yourself. And so humility is, in fact, the vehicle by which you must travel this road. You must humble yourself. You've probably heard of this young man that that Jesus encounters. And and I just want to read a little excerpt of this encounter in Mark chapter 10. Jesus encounters a rich young man. And this young man, by the way, is great in every regard. And even, I mean, he even tells Jesus that Jesus, the Bible says, loves him because of it. He's like, well, what what a cool dude. He's just innocent. Like, I mean, what a funny thing. But but I want to read this to you because he's encountering sort of this, this problem, and Jesus brings it right to light for him. 
in Mark chapter 10, verse 17, it says that as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and he fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus nails him right between the eyes with this statement, by the way. He says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Listen, the reason why Jesus said that is because the man believed that he was good. And so he goes on, he says, you know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not, not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother, etc., etc. And Jesus, the teacher, he says to Jesus, he says, all these I've kept since I was a boy. And then the Bible says Jesus looked at him and loved him. He says, one thing you lack. Go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. And then you'll have treasure in heaven. And then walk down the road. Then you can walk the road. Then, he says, come follow me. Well, the Bible says that the man's face fell. He went away very sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus looked around, around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And why is it hard? Because humility is the vehicle by which you must travel this road. When I was in junior high, I don't know if I've said this to you before or not, but I'll tell you this story too. When, when I was in junior high, I, I made friends with a, a fellow by the name of David, and I've lost touch with David. I don't know where he is or what he's doing. I really hope he's done something great with his life. But, but we were both on a road that wasn't leading us to a great place. And uh, we started as junior high boys becoming fascinated with fire, and we started lighting little fires, and we went to school, and we, we were lighting fires at school and lunch, hiding them. Well, we lit a fire at school, and uh, one day, this was back in Roswell, New Mexico. Roswell's a desert, by the way. It was very dry. It's not like we were in Ohio where you could light a fire and you're not going to burn a green forest down. But we didn't have any green. Everything was brown. Kind of like Hemet, I guess, in a way. And so we, we were lighting these little fires at lunch and uh, thinking that it was cool and that we'd get a little thrill and get away with it. Well, one day we lit the fire and... The wind came and blew, and we couldn't stomp it out. And we turned and tried to stomp out a little fire over here. We couldn't stomp that out. We tried to stomp it over here. And after about, I don't know, it seemed like forever, but it was probably only like 10 or 15 seconds, we realized, which by the way, if the wind's blowing and you're lighting fires in a dead grass kind of field, you're probably going to start some crazy fire, you know? And wisdom has taught me this, all right, and experience. Anyways, we lit the field on fire. And it wasn't a field. I mean, it was just a playground, I guess. At, I mean, in middle school, you don't really have a playground, but it was the lunch area and the, the fields where they'd play soccer and stuff. And, and so the fire grew, and, and we ran from the fire, and everyone, and you know how junior highs are, they all ran to the fire, right? And so they, they run to the fire, like, yeah, fire run to the fire so the teachers and everyone out there were freaking out and and we were scared out of our minds and we ran from the fire anyways as everybody was running towards the fire we were running away and then we quickly realized we should turn around and join the crowd so we don't look like the oddballs out so we ran back with them to the fire and I remember this one kid his name was Lewis he lived around the corner from me and he started jumping over the flame and the fire had spread he it was huge now he's jumping over the flames and then he's thinking it was funny you know like Ah ha, and the fire's growing this way. It's big now. I mean, it's big. And the teachers finally get everybody together and get them away to safety. And the fire moves over to a shed where they kept all the lawn equipment. And the shed begins to burn. Um, and I'm scared. At this point, I'm scared out of my mind. I'm like, I, I, mean, I mean, as a junior high boy, you think, you're thinking the worst. You're like, I'm going to be in jail for the rest of my life. Um, this is really bad. And so I go, they finally, the, the fire department comes, they finally get the fire under control, and they get us back into class. And I'm sitting, and I was in orchestra. I played the viola. 
And I'm in my orchestra class, and, uh, and I'm just sitting there and just scared out of my mind, like praying to God, please don't let them find out it was me. Okay, and David, right? And it was both of us. And so, um, so anyways, so halfway through orchestra class, some, some student office aid person comes to class with a note with my name on it. Says, Chris, they need you in the office right away. And I'm like, oh, this is it. I'm done. I'm dead. And so I leave class, and I walk down that hallway, and I'm thinking the entire time, and this is how good of a friend I am, uh, but I was a terrible friend. I was thinking the entire time, I'm going to blame it all on David. Okay? And so, so I get to the office, and I had this plan worked out in my mind. It's all David's fault. You know, and, and there David is, sitting in the office already. He'd already met with the principal. And I'm like, oh, this is bad. <laughs> he ratted me out. I mean, this is bad. So... And I, by the way, I, I was a good kid. It doesn't sound like I was a good kid, right? I, I, I was a good kid. I had never been to the principal's office in my life, like not even gotten one demerit, one referral, never a detent, nothing. And so I'm, I walk into the principal's office, scared out of my mind, and I stuck, I stuck with the plan. I was an idiot. I, I told the principal that it was all David's fault. Well, he let me go back to class, but he kept David in the office. I was shocked by that. And there was a moment where I thought, I got away with this. I got away with this. And so my sister was one grade above me. I was in seventh grade. She was in eighth grade. We were both at the same school. And by that time, everyone knew who it was. I mean, it had gotten around. Word had gotten around school that they knew who it was that lit the fire. So she knew it was me. And we rode the bus home. And so I'm on the bus. And I, the entire time home, I'm saying, listen, I'm trying to convince her not to tell my mom and dad. I'm like, listen, I will do your chores for the rest of your life, okay? Look, I mean, for the rest of your life, that's a long time. And she's still alive, by the way. I'm not doing her chores still, but I'm like, I'll do them for the rest of your life. I'll do this and this and whatever. I mean, every, anything you want, you name it, I'll do it. Just don't say anything. And so I'm begging for grace. I'm like, give me grace, <laughs> please give me grace. Anyways, she says, okay. I'm like, oh, all right. That's the deal then. So we walk home from the bus stop. We get inside, and as soon as we open the door, she says, Mom, you'll never guess what happened today. Chris almost burned the school down. And I'm like, what, what just happened? We had a deal. I begged her for grace, and I didn't get any that day. And I didn't get any from my parents either. Paul says, I am less than the least of all of God's people, and this grace was given to me. There's something powerful about being a recipient of grace. And why was this grace given to, to Paul? Why? Why was it given to him? He says, I'm, the, I'm less than the least. But it was given to me. And it was given to him because God had a plan for his life. And he goes on right in that same verse to tell you why God poured out grace in his life. And he poured out the grace in his life so that he could preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. And so God showed him tremendous grace. He saved him. He redeemed him so that he could preach a message, a message that he had experienced firsthand of the boundless riches of Christ. I read a quote that someone said, when you begin to understand the magnitude of our unsearchable riches in Christ, it swells in you a hunger to want more of the giver and less of the gift. And there's something interesting, just a nuance of how every translator, by the way, and I went and looked at multiple translations of this, every translator has translated this phrase as the boundless riches of Christ. And you may read that and say, oh yeah, what do you mean by that? Well, listen, and I underline this in my notes and in my Bible, the word of, because it's not the boundless riches from Christ. It's not the boundless riches that you will receive in Christ. It's the boundless riches of Christ. 
And so there's something, there's a nuance to this that says that the riches are not really what you receive from Christ, but the riches are found in themselves within Christ. He is the giver. And so to have the giver is far better than to simply have the gift. So many people are interested in the gifts, but it's far better to have the giver. You guys are all familiar with the story of the prodigal son. The lost son. The son who had went to his father and had said, I wish you were dead, dad. Which, by the way, back in those days, if you were a son, you had a contract in a way with dad that when he died, you were going to receive your portion of the inheritance. And it was literally like a contract. I mean, it was that, that much a part of the culture and of the tradition of the day that you were guaranteed this. Well, this son comes along and he says, Dad, I wish you were dead already. I mean, I would like to have my inheritance now. And so the dad says, okay, I'll give you your portion today. Well, well good, thanks. So he divvies up the portion of the inheritance for this, this son, and he gives it to him. We don't know how much it is. Maybe in today's dollars, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. Maybe it's even in the millions. We don't know. We just know it was a large sum of money. And so he gives it to the son, and the son says, thanks, dad. I'm out of here. And he takes off and leaves. You see, he had received the gift. He had received the gift. And he took the gift and he went running off to some crazy awesome place where he lived it up. I mean, he partied, he had fun and, you know, all of those things that the world has to offer. And he had a good time, I'm sure. He had a really good time for a while. Sin's fun for a while. There's no doubt about that. And so he had a really good time for a while. But then he woke up one day, reached into his pocket, and all his money was gone. He had spent it all. And he had wasted it, and he was broke now. And the Bible tells us that he became so broke and so poor and so desperate just to eat that he found himself one day working for a guy who had a pig farm, and he was there feeding pigs. And he's in the midst of this pig farm feeding pigs, longing to just be able to eat the food that he's giving to the pigs. He's that hungry. And in that place, he has a thought. And his thought is simply this. My dad has servants like me right now that are far better off than I am. Maybe if I go back and just beg, just beg him. He'll make me a servant. And at least I'll have some food and a warm place to sleep. And so he creates a speech. He rehearses this speech. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Would you please make me one of your hired hands? And so he pulls himself out of the slop and he makes the journey back home. And the Bible says that as he was a far, as he was a far ways off, the father who's out sees the silhouette of his son. He recognizes the gait. He says, that, that, I, think, I think that's him. I think he came back. He drops whatever he's doing. He runs to his son, and in his filth, he wraps his arms around him, and the Bible says he begins to kiss him. I don't know if I'd kiss a guy that had been working with pigs. But he doesn't care. And the son begins to rehearse the speech back to his dad. As dad has got his arms around him, as he's showering him with kisses, he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And you know what the very next words of the father were? Somebody go get the best robe I've got. Go get it. Find my best ring. Put it on my son's finger. Because my son who was lost is now found. And we're having a party tonight. Because he's come home. 
You see, the son discovered something powerful that day. He discovered that to have the giver is far better than to simply have the gift. And there's something powerful about that. I read a quote from a guy named Mark Roberts. He says, but I'm, I'm personally connected to the greatest wealth of all, and so are you if you're a follower of Christ. For Paul says that you have the boundless riches of Christ. And what does he mean by the word boundless riches? The word boundless, if you translate it from Greek back into English, or if you go back to Greek, it literally means that which cannot be measured or counted or comprehended. It suggests that no matter how deep we go in our understanding of Christ's riches, we'll never get to the bottom. Christ has more riches than could ever be counted. It, it reminds me of a story of a couple of hunters who went hunting in a field. And as they were out hunting, they realized that they were on someone's private property. And so they, they, they started walking towards the farm that they saw there. And, and as they approached the farm, it looked like it was pretty shabby. I mean, it was, there wasn't much there. A couple of chickens here, and they saw a goat over there. And then they saw this old well over here. They didn't see any signs of, of people or whatever. And they, they thought, wow, that's interesting. Let, let's go check out that well. So they walked over to the well, and they looked in it and shouted down, hey! And it echoed, you know, and... You know, they're like, wow, this thing's, this thing's deep. Let's find out how deep it is. Let's throw something in there. So they, they look around and they see this old transmission sitting over there. So they both walk over and they, they pick this transmission up. And they get over to the edge of the well and they drop it in. They're like, well, we're going to wait. Let's listen for the splash. So they drop it in, right? And, uh, and it starts to fall and disappears into the dark. And they're like, oh, man, I didn't, I didn't hear anything. Did you hear it? No, I don't hear nothing. Well, just then they turned around to walk away and they see the goat charging at them. And they're like, oh, no, the goat's run. I mean, he's coming at them full speed. Boom. And they jump out of the way just in time for the goat to go by them and over the side down into the well. And they're like, what in the world just happened? And then right then the farmer comes out. He comes to him and he says, uh, he says, hey, hey, fellas, how's it going? They're like, oh, hey, listen, you listen, we, we just came to see if we get permission to hunt on your land. And he's like, oh, yeah, no problem. You can hunt on my land. I don't mind. And they're like, and, and by the way, you have, you have this crazy goat. He's like, yeah, where, where is my goat? He was just here a minute ago. And they were like, well, he came charging at us, the craziest thing. And then he, he jumped over the well and went down. And, and they said, listen, uh, you know, you really should tie that goat up. And the farmer says, well, I did. I tied him to an old transmission. Well, there you go. <laughs> wow well there was no splash though i didn't i mean the, the, I, the, nobody heard a splash so maybe he's still falling i don't know but but listen we're never going to get to the bottom of god's riches the boundless riches of christ are endless. You're never going to get to the bottom of it. You're never going to find the end of it. What does it mean, the boundless riches of Christ? I think he means that when you, when it, when you come to Jesus, you're going to find everything that you've been searching for. You'll find the answers to all of your questions. You'll find the purpose and the meaning of your life. Jesus says, I've come to give you life and to give you life abundantly. You'll discover that you're not an accident. And that your life was planned and purposed by God. For you're the object of God's mighty love. And your value is immeasurable. And God's love for you is infinite. And you will find that God loves you as you are. Right where you are. You don't have to change your life to be loved by Him. You simply have to choose to come to Him. Come with all of your baggage. You don't have to clean yourself up first. He doesn't care about your past and all the mistakes that you've made. He'll embrace you just as you are. And he'll welcome you home. Just like that lost son. He doesn't care about any of those things. He just wants you. He wants you to come to him. 
I think there's somebody listening today, maybe here, maybe online. And these words, as I say them, are just rolling off of you like water off of a duck's back. Because you bought into an idea that you're worthless. When I was, when I was seven years old, I too bought into the idea that I was worthless. You see, in school, we, we had made these, um, these cutting boards for our, our moms on Mother's Day. And I had drawn some pictures and some things like that that a little boy would draw. And I gave it to my mom on Mother's Day, and she hung it on, on the wall in the kitchen. And, and one day, she got angry with me. And she pulled that cutting board off the wall, and she broke that cutting board over my back. And I ran to my room, and I wept. And I wept not, not so much because of the pain of the board on my back, but I wept because it was the first time in my life that a seed was planted in my mind. The thought came to me, I'm worthless. And I wrestled with that for a long time. And my response to that was to retreat into myself. So I became the quietest and the shyest kid around. I didn't say much. I didn't volunteer to speak. I didn't raise my hand. I was just that quiet and reserved little boy. And that day, I began to build walls in my life, walls to protect myself from ever being exposed. No one could know the truth about me, or at least the truth that I thought was true, that I was worthless. Someone here has had a similar experience where the words were whispered into your mind, you're worthless. And you too have built some walls in your life for fear that someone might discover that you're worthless. Listen, I want to tell you something. If you don't remove some of the walls and allow the truth of God's word to penetrate your life, you'll never experience the boundless riches of God. He loves you as you are. And those words did not come from him. You are not worthless to him. He gave his life for you, and he loves you. This road, if you walk it, it will lead you to a place where you belong. And your life will be a witness. We all want to belong. All of us. We all have a deep longing and a desire to be a part of something, to be wanted, to be important, to have purpose and meaning. We want to belong. And so Paul says his intent was that now through the church, and by the way, the church is the place where you belong. It's the family of God, simply put. It's just a group of people. It's not a building or a place. God has invited you to come and to be a part of his family, to be a part of the church. The road will lead you to a place where you belong and your life will be a witness I want to close with this thought. This is a powerful thought, and, and, um, and it's a truth that Paul says here, and it's so subtle, and I've, I've meditated on it all week, by the way. It's just so deep and powerful. Listen to his words. He says, His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known 
to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. What in the world is he saying here? What is he saying that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms? Well, he's talking about angels and demons. He's talking about the invisible creatures that God has created that exist in that world, in the heavenly realms. David Gusick once said, he said, God doesn't use the angels to reveal his wisdom to the saints, the saints being those who have walked this road, but he does use the saints to reveal his wisdom to the angelic beings, both faithful and fallen angels. We are called to be the means by which God teaches the universe a lesson and a beautiful lesson. So you picture this, all of God's angels and all of Satan's angels, the demons, are out there in a big grandstand, if you will. And you and I are on the stage. And we are living out our lives and God is working in us and through us. And they're watching intently with amazement as they're being instructed in the wisdom of God as He works in your life, as they see these sinful, weak, immoral, finite beings who are the objects of God's mighty love and the Spirit of God working in you and loving you and forgiving you and giving you grace every day And it's a constant, repetitive cycle. And the angelic beings are being instructed as God loves you in the wisdom of God. So they have something to learn. And the lesson is being taught as God works in your life. Wow. What an amazing thought. What an incredible thought. Your life is a witness, not just to the people here, but to the angelic realms, to the angels, those that serve God, to the evil ones that serve the devil. Your life is a witness to them that speaks of the incredible wisdom of God. Lee, he was a reporter for the Chicago Tribune and a self-professed atheist. He was sitting at his desk on Christmas Eve. A slow news day, he found himself reminiscing about the Delgado family that he had featured while writing a series of articles about Chicago's neediest people a few days earlier. The Delgados were comprised of a grandmother named Perfecta and her two granddaughters, Jenny, age 13, and her sister Lydia, 11 years old. He remembered how unprepared he was when he walked into their two-room apartment on the west side of Chicago. Bare halls, bare walls, no furniture, no rugs, nothing but a kitchen table and a handful of rice in the cupboards. He learned during the interview that Jenny and Lydia only had one short-sleeved dress apiece, plus a thin gray sweater that they shared. And on cold days, when the girls walked the half mile to school, one of the girls would start with the sweater and then give it to the other halfway through. It was all they had. Perfecta wanted more for her granddaughters and would gladly have worked, but her severe arthritis and her age made work too difficult and painful. And since it was a slow news day, Lee decided to check out a car and drive to Chicago's west side to check up on the Delgados. When Jenny opened the door, he couldn't believe what he saw. His article on the Delgados had touched the hearts of many subscribers who responded with furniture and appliances and rugs and dozens of coats, scarves and gloves everywhere. The girls wouldn't have to share a sweater ever again. There was cartons and cartons and boxes of food everywhere. They had so much food that the cupboards and closets couldn't contain it. Someone had even donated a Christmas tree and under it were mounds of presents and thousands of dollars in cash. Lee was astonished. 
But what astonished him the most was what he found Perfecta and her granddaughters doing. They were preparing to give most of it away. Why would you give so much of this away, Lee asked. Perfecta responded, Our neighbors are still in need. We cannot have plenty while they have nothing. This is what Jesus would want us to do. Lee was dumbfounded. After regaining his composure, he asked Perfecta another question. He wanted to know what she and the girls thought about the generosity that was shown to them. Again, Lee was not prepared for the answer. She said, this is wonderful. This is very good. We did nothing to deserve this. It's all a gift from God. But she added, it's not his greatest gift. No, we celebrate that tomorrow on Christmas Day. Lee was speechless as he drove back to the office in the quiet of his car. He noted a couple of observations. He had plenty, and along with it, plenty of anxiety. While the Delgados, despite their poverty, had peace, Lee had everything and yet wanted more, but the Delgados had nothing and yet knew generosity. Lee had everything, and yet his life was as bare as the Delgados' apartment. And yet the Delgados, who had nothing, were filled with hope, contentment, and they had a spiritual certainty. Even though Lee had so much more than the Delgados, he longed for what they had in their poverty. Humility is the vehicle by which you must travel this road. And so today, I invite you to humble yourself and to begin the road, a journey down this road, the road marked in blood. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you today. We thank you so much for the day. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for loving us as we are, for dying for us even in the midst of our sin. You didn't require some contract or some deal where we had to clean our lives up first. But you loved us, even in the midst of our filth. And you died for us on a cross. Maybe you're here today and maybe you're saying, you know what? I'm ready to walk that road. I think it's time. I think it's time that I humble myself and that I walk that road marked in blood and make my way to the foot of the cross. And if that's you today, I I'm going to invite you right now, right where you are, to give your life to Jesus. And you can do it simply by just telling God how much you desperately need him in your life. telling him you made a lot of mistakes, asking him to forgive you. The Bible tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. So maybe today you just need to say, Lord, I've made a lot of mistakes. Please forgive me. I desperately need you in my life. If that's you, if you prayed that prayer, I want to tell you that God is faithful and just to forgive you. That he has welcomed you and invited you into his family. And that just that simple prayer, walking humbly down that road, brings you into his family. Listen, if you're here today and you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you to stand up. I'm going to ask you to stand up, just right where you're sitting. Just stand up. Listen, it, it's not about anybody else in the room. This is about you and God. This is between you and him. And if you're choosing today to follow him, this is, not, this is not a time to be embarrassed. It's time for you to say, Lord, I'm in. I'm all in. I'm choosing today to give you my life. If that's you, I invite you to stand.
just right where you're sitting, just stand. Just say, Lord, my life is yours. I'm committing my life to you today. If that's you, you stand. Maybe you're listening online. If, if that's you at home, stand up. Stand. And say, Lord, I'm standing today. I'm giving my life to you. Lord, I pray for those who have stood, who are giving their lives to you today, Lord, who have prayed that prayer, asking that you would just bless them, that your promises would be true in their life, that they would feel the power of your presence, they would know the peace that comes from you, that they would begin to understand what it means to be forgiven and to be loved, that the lie that you are worthless would be washed away in the reality that their heavenly Father who purposed and planned their life, loves them immeasurably. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Happy Valentine's Day. Tell somebody today that you love them. <laughs> Have a great day.